Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to our session, Ukraine, What Next? My name is Mirek Dushek. I am with the World Economic Forum. We just heard from the First Lady of Ukraine in the plenary, uh, and it could not be a more pivotal time to be here to really see how the international community can not only keep up the support for Ukraine, but uh, to do more. So in less than four weeks, it will have been one year since the onset of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has resulted in tens of thousands of deaths and uh, acute refugee crisis, with over 7 million Ukrainians having fled their country and nearly 5 million displaced within its borders. Beyond the tragic loss of life and humanitarian crisis facing the country, the war has uprooted the country's economy and society. Ukraine's government has forecast the economy to have shrunk by more than 30% in 2022, the sharpest economic contraction in the country's independent history. And a significant budget deficit has put immense strain on Ukraine's finances and monetary policy. The country's infrastructure remains under constant bombardment, causing shortage of, shortages of electricity, water, and energy. Ukraine's private sector before the war accounted for 70% of GDP. The government now estimates that more than 11% of businesses have shut down and more than half of all enterprises operate below 75% of production capacity. According to the government, 5 million jobs have been lost, equivalent to 30% of total pre-war employment. Against all odds, the state continues to carry out its function and duties and the economy overall has fared better than expected. So today we have an august panel uh, with us today to, to really help us understand the latest situation on the battlefield militarily, the urgent humanitarian crisis and needs of the Ukrainian people, how the public and private sectors are coping, as well as the country's long-term reconstruction and its place uh, within Europe. So I mentioned an August panel, so let me introduce uh, my colleagues here on the panel. It's my pleasure to welcome here Yulia Sviridenko, first Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Economy of Ukraine. A warm welcome to you. Uh, yes, thank you. Oleksiy Chernyshov, uh, Chief Executive Officer Naftogaz in Ukraine. A warm welcome. Viles Kinari, Minister for Development, Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland. Welcome. <laughs> Odile Françoise Renaud Basso, President, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Warm welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, your Cookies, State Secretary, Federal Chancellery of Germany. Madam Deputy Prime Minister, let me start with you. Mm -hmm. If you could first uh, just tell us the latest situation in your country, because uh, militarily, but also what are the immediate needs that the international community, and as you know here, we have also a lot of business leaders, over 1,500 business leaders are here in, uh, in, at the annual meeting in Davos, and we have a lot of people that are watching us uh, via, via webcast. So if you could please tell us what is the latest situation in your country, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you for this question. So actually, uh, the name of this panel, uh, what next for Ukraine, actually it's success. Because we're discussing future. It means that everybody uh, understands that Russia won't achieve its goal and we definitely win. Uh, uh, this war. So uh, it's very hard, of course, to, to speak about future right now when uh, Ukraine is under the constant uh, missiles strikes, like uh, we uh, witnessed in this weekend, mm. uh, the, the big massive uh, attack on the residential building in Dnipro. So it means that uh, all questions related to what, what is the future for Ukraine uh, will start uh, with the question, what can be additional support for military 
for weapon for the heavy, heavy weapon for Ukraine for now, just to speed up the victory and to start the rebuilding, reconstruction, and to return back our refugees that you mentioned at the beginning. So for now, uh, the situation is following where I keep fighting. Uh, we are asking our partners, allies, to provide us with additional, additional weapon, with a heavy weapon, armaments, everything to squeeze Russia from Ukrainian territory. Second thing, uh, we are able and willing to discuss peaceful formula that were, were launched by the President Zelensky and were announced, and today First Lady also uh, mentioned peaceful formula in her speech. So it's very important right now to move from the, um, from the paper to practical implementation mm -hmm. and to take, to take responsibility. Uh, and it's our, our task, it's uh, for our partners to find exact country that will take exact re re responsibility over some steps of this peaceful formula. Mm -hmm. And of course, last year we achieved macro Relatively, relatively macroeconomic stability together with our partners, with IOFIs. And we talked a lot about strategy of post-war recovery, strategy of uh, the recovery during the war time. So now we need to move from the strategy to the concrete projects, concrete project for recovery and uh, uh, reconstruction. As you mentioned, and I absolutely agree with you. So it's a big uh, humanitarian catastrophe that 7 million Ukrainians are living abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, it named like a refugees, but for us it's, it's not refugees because it's temporarily displaced people. As majority of them, 90% would like to return back to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So what we need to discuss right now with our IFIs, our partners, what kind of solution could be found for uh, business to encourage them to uh, start business in Ukraine, to come to uh, participate in early recovery, so to achieve this goal, to return our people back. And uh, so that's why it's, 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 uh, I think that Ukrainian shows resilience during this wartime, and I think that uh, Ukrainian business also show this resilience, and it's such kind of characteristic of Ukrainians that can help foreign investment to come and to feel comfortable and to achieve their goals. So that's why our idea is, first of all, to stress on the necessity to provide this additional military support and, of course, to find some additional tools with our IFIs partners, uh, how we can facilitate Ukrainian business to develop and how we can facilitate foreign investment to come to Ukraine even now with different mechanisms such as insurance for the war risks, for example, mm. or some additional finance that can be provided. Thank you. Can I just have a small follow-up question on the peace formula? Yes. The First Lady spent quite a long time mm -hmm. on it in her speech. I think she also mentioned, if I understood correctly, that Ukraine is working with as many countries as it can to develop it or implement it. Could you just elaborate a little bit yes. on the process? So, uh, at the end of uh, February is going to be a special um, session of Un United Nations when the, pre where, where the President Zelensky will discuss how it, we might implement together with our partners mm -hmm. this peaceful formula. So it means that we, are, we would like to participate in the implementation of this peaceful formula as much, a country, as much countries as it possible. For all those countries that are searching for a peace for Ukraine and are able to participate. Because some, for example, agri food security uh, everybody understands that it's a very practical issue and it's about well, blocking of the seaports, it's about um, transportation routes, about uh, stock, uh, was, uh, war houses. Uh, so that's why we, we, we think that it's 10 very obvious steps mm -hmm. that can bring peace. Uh, our idea is uh, to find partners that will take responsibility over some of these steps. So together with Ukraine to provide us with this additional guarantee for implementation of this peaceful formula. Very interesting. Thank you. Let me move to uh, Mr. Chernyshov. Uh, you're heading an energy company. We have seen Ukraine's infrastructure come under severe attack, particularly since October. Nonetheless, you said last week that engineers, together with local authorities and utility workers, have restored more than 55% of energy infrastructure facilities destroyed or damaged by Russia. It's quite impressive given the circumstances. Could you just give us a sense of what is the extent of the damage that your country's energy infrastructure has undergone 
and how are you working to restore access to ensure that the economy can function to the largest extent possible? Just to give us a little bit of a sense of the damage and the landscape overall on energy. Yes, absolutely. First of all, good afternoon to everybody. I thank you, all of you, for visiting this important panel for all of us. As it is being said on the wall, World Economic Forum, the ambition and the commitment to improve the state of this world, I think this improvement might, might start from Ukraine and from our historical moment that we are facing together, all of us. This is not only a Ukrainian issue, and our allies are demonstrating it constantly. That is the challenge for all civilized world right now. And I believe we're going to cope with it. Coming back to energy situation, this is a full-scale war, especially starting after October 10. Russians have started actively targeting critical infrastructure, moreover, civilian critical infrastructure. Their target is to deprive Ukrainians from heating, water, gas, and other utilities. The target is to break Ukrainian spirit. The strategy will not work. This will only strengthen Ukrainian, strengthen Ukrainian spirit to fight and to prevail. Right now, our short-term short -term task is to survive, to go through the winter. This means more gas. This means more energy, more generators, more decentralized energy. Uh, guarantee and supply and moreover we should go ahead and win this war uh, in terms of uh, the repairs uh, that we are doing we are doing them constantly every day as, as we are being actively attacked and uh, in, in this way we have also done a lot of things within decentral decentralized supply of energy mm -hmm. and we are planning to increase Using this opportunity, I would like to thank you to our international allies and partners who support us in this way. And this is critical and very important for Ukraine. Of course, we are still targeting to get more gas during the course of this winter. We are targeting, targeting to get more uh, generation equipment, uh, to get more energy. And we expect uh, more uh, losses in this area. Th that is clear. And later on, we plan to reconstruct uh, the whole system and uh, to make it as modern as possible, as green as possible, mm -hmm. and as decarbonized as possible. Mm -hmm. But this will happen after the war. Our main task right now is to win this war and to prevail mm -hmm. in this war. Thank you so much. Alexei, if you don't mind, just to give us a, to give us a sense, for example, if you are living now in Kiev, or Lviv, how much electricity do you have? Is it, is, is it, unless there is bombardment, you have electricity or are there outages? So just to give a sense of uh, people's lives in, in, in Ukraine now. So the ordinary life in Kiev might look in the way that you might have been shortened in electricity four to six hours per day. Might be more, depending on the situation with the grid and with the possibilities. Uh, it's not like constantly like this, but the most of the days we have certain sh shortages with electricity. We are fixing uh, our energy system, but we all should understand the, repairment, the repairing of energy system is more a duct tape repairing type. Yeah. So we should really restructure and reconstruct it after the war once it is possible, but we should be proud of our infrastructure workers and employees and communal services employees who are doing all these repairs under the constant shelling, bullets and other risk of life. We have secured 300,000 of Donbass residents in Donetsk region right now with a natural gas supply. It's a very hard job to do, very risky, but this is our target. We want to prevail. We want to win this war. And we'll go ahead. Thank you. And one more thing on the private sector front. So we talk a lot about, I will talk about it later, public-private for reconstruction, long-term reconstruction. But is there a role for private sector actors now in providing immediate needs, particularly around energy or in general? And is it happening? Could you give us some examples? Even business-wise? 
from private sector companies? Yeah, of course, uh, it's a huge potential in Ukraine. Uh, it might sound ridiculous during the war, and of course, it's, uh, uh, you, you should consider a uh, risk potential, but still, uh, the reconstruction of the country might require private equity to flow into the country, and uh, the governmental support uh, from Ukraine and other countries would also motivate private equity uh, to invest into Ukraine. In terms of energy, of course, our task is to achieve energy independence uh, level, uh, within the gas production, we plan to increase gas production already this year significantly, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, constructing of decentralized energy supply. Uh, all these fields would require significant equity invest investors, but we should consider this in this moment, of course, uh, under the uh, umbrella of uh, appropriate guarantees uh, from, from the international society that would uh, gu guarantee uh, this kind of private equity investment. Thank you so much. Turning to Vela Skinari, uh, your Minister for Development, Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland. You just visited uh, Ukraine. So first, what is your assessment militarily, if you can share, in terms of what you saw, but also then again those immediate needs? And uh, you're from Finland, so it's an EU country as well. So are there things you think Europe can do even more that you learned there that we should be thinking about in Europe so that uh, we can, uh, again, help right now uh, more uh, the Ukrainian people? Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for having me here. Yes, I, I did visit Kiev and Ukraine a week ago and I was very impressed when it comes to resilience and and bravery of, of Ukrainian people, especially in the face of these <clears throat> recent strikes on critical infrastructure. For Finland, of course, the support of Ukraine has been very important and it's been very significant and we distributed family housing mm -hmm. for, for families um, in the region of Kiev to, to Irpin. And we also uh, worked hard for energy supplies, different equipment generators by our rescue services. And of course, it's been very important that we've been able to act quickly, fast, and we've been able to distribute and of course, Finland is very committed to continue our support together with our European <coughs> Union allies and with our international allies as well. Uh, when it comes to, to reconstruction, well, of, of course, I want to underline and the, the most important thing is, is to act now when the need is there. For Finland, it's been altogether last year only. And as you know, we've been supporting Ukraine since 2014. Last year, only more than 300 million euros, including material support, humanitarian and all equipments, everything included. But of course, then we have to look at the, uh, our European commitment, our development financing together with our global uh, uh, entities, if you like. And therefore, it's so important that, for instance, here today, we are together to look at the way how we operate, how we coordinate, with what kind of emphasis we work. And of course, the most important thing is to have a dialogue with you, Ukrainians, decision makers, everybody, the people, that what are the real needs. And that's why we really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, moving to uh, Madame Renaud Basson. So you're heading an extremely important organization. Um, in terms of, uh, of course, reconstruction and development globally, and you're playing such an important role in Ukraine. Uh, if my numbers are correct here, you've deployed 1.7 billion euros uh, and a further 200 million uh, mobilized from partner banks to support the real economy in Ukraine through investments in vital infrastructure, energy, food security, trade, and support for the private sector. A lot of people talk about we need an, a Marshall Plan uh, for Ukraine, so tell us a little bit about, because I'm, you have, of course, people also that are working with you on the ground. So what is the role EBRD is 
playing right now in terms of these immediate needs, but also crucially then, if we say this is a Marshall Plan for Ukraine, obviously we are in the 21st century. So what are the things you're working on and what would be things that are maybe a different, things we should be paying attention to, to make it really relevant for uh, uh, then uh, not only rebuilding, but building a modern economy in the 21st century Ukraine? So thank you, but I, I think as a it has already been said. What is very, very important is to support Ukraine now. And uh, indeed, we need to prepare for reconstruction and to think about it and to get organized about it. But I think that the more we do now, the better. First of all, the more it will give chance to the country to win the war and um, the less we will have to do in reconstruction. And in a way, it's not. Um, I think we are in an environment which is we already start to reconstruct. Reconstruct. Everything we do in terms of emergency repair since uh, the attack on the key infrastructure have started in uh, October is, uh, I mean, starting already to reconstruct. Of course, we will have to do much more later on, but really providing support now is absolutely key. At EBRD, because we are a bank focusing mainly on the private sector, what we've done this year is really to focus on the real economy. Mm -hmm. How, what we can do effectively to support um, the real economy, so the key infrastructure to keep going, and we provided financing to buy gas uh, very early on, to support the electricity network company, and we provided now 300, I mean 450 million uh, financing to the company this year, and uh, including emergency repair in order to help them to buy uh, generators, to um, uh, buy the material they need in order to uh, fix as quickly as possible the infrastructure, but also the railway company, and um, also a lot of focus on the private sector, food I mean, in the um, agribusiness, working directly with the, our clients there, but also in with sharing with the banking system. Mm -hmm. What is absolutely amazing, and I was in Ukraine before, I mean, in October, is the fact that everything continues to function. I mean, I mean, yeah. and we all think about, we see the very, very, I mean, devastating destruction and so forth. But when you think that the banking sector, they all have their branch opened in the country for clients and, I mean, everything function. So it's, but of, of course, they need support, but I mean, the resilience is really impressive. Um, so that's what we've been doing, and other IFIs have been focusing more on budget support because mo the government need money yep. because of the collapse of uh, tax revenues, uh, because of the GDP shrinking, and also additional expenditure related to the war. So, but so there is a, a good complementarity there. I think what so we need to continue to do that, and we are committed to do this uh, going next year. Uh, we've been able to do that thanks to donors and shareholder support, because for a bank, it's very challenging to, it's a high level risk. Uh, we, we, we are financing clients who may, I mean, for investment they are doing, which may be destroyed the day after, so their capacity to repay is not, is not I mean, very clear. Uh, but we, are, we have been able to take this risk, uh, and we take half of the risk on our balance sheet, and we get donor support for the, the remaining 50%. And it has been a huge uh, international effort, because we got 1.2, uh, 1.3 billion of donor support from EU countries, the US, I mean, all our shareholders. And that has been very important. And I think it's important to acknowledge also, also the level of support received, I mean, and the mobilization uh, for Ukraine, uh, and that that has been very important to keep going this year. And, it, and continuing to do that will be important in the future. One important dimension in the reconstruction will be the reform agenda. And we are continue, of course, in the war, I mean, you focus on the emergency, so the deep structural reform are much more difficult to undertake. But it's important to, to say now we are still working a lot with our clients, for example, in the SOE sector to ensure that good governance uh, is there, that you have good uh, governing body, um, uh, international members for um, international and international standards for the governing uh, all the I mean the board members and so forth and this is something we remain very demanding and we will continue to do so because it's the key to ensure that the money we invest is well spent uh, that we continue to fight corruption and so forth and moving forward I think that we will have to continue to work and this will be part of the Marshall Plan or the reconstruction plan to uh, bring in continued transformation of the country, improve the efficiency of, um, I mean, 
public administration, even if they have the, the in the context of the war, there has been a huge effort. You know, for example, we have, I mean, I think the Ukrainian administration are ahead of a lot of developed countries in uh, digitalization and, and so forth. So there has, this change is still ongoing now, but this will be part of the, of the agenda. One important element of co also in the reconstruction will be coordination. To have a good coordination, and now I think the G7 has set, put in place a coordination structure with, uh, uh, with Ukrainian, we, uh, with other IFIs have also developed a sort of, and with the Ukrainian government, they've put in place co operational coordination structure in order to be sure that we are all moving in the same direction using, I mean, best, the best qualities of each of us in order to be the most effective possible on the ground. Thank you so much. Moving to Germany, uh, Mr. Kukis, you are uh, State Secretary, Federal Chancellor of Germany. If I understand it correctly, you are advising on the economy to the Chancellor in that function, but also on EU affairs. Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so, uh, of course, you had G G7 presidency. Overall, if you can also just, from Germany's perspective, how do you see Germany and Europe is responding to the immediate needs of the Ukrainian people? And then I would also um, like to get your perspective on, of course, reconstruction now, but what are the elements that would make it, number one, relevant for Ukraine, but also uh, then uh, uh, making it um, building blocks of a modern economy in the future, so again, for the 21st century? Yep. Okay, so uh, that question could fill a whole even evening, so I'll try to answer it briefly. I think the, the two things that were vital in terms of the work that we did at the G7 level and the European level was on the one side the sanctions regime imposed by the G7 in record time. I still remember the time between the shock of the night of the 24th of February, um, but then immediately starting to think about what can we do to, three, to freeze the 300 billion. Um, of central bank assets because we had seen some indications in the week before that money was being withdrawn um, and we said we have to before before the weekend ends we have to cut that channel mm -hmm. of repatriation of funds that's uh, the biggest damage we can do in the shortest amount of time on the Russian war machine um, so the fact that we were able not only to decide within the G7 um, on the policy, but also in the European Union of the 27 on legislative acts that we passed like literally 10 minutes before midnight uh, from Sunday to Monday to make this effective, that was probably the, the, the first big rallying call to show we are very, very united. And then, of course, the elements of the sanction regime um, number one, two, three that are less discussed, I think, are now seeing the damage they are extracting on the Russian war machine. You know, the ban on all kinds of semiconductor exports, the ban on all exports of dual use goods, I think is really hurting Russia's ability um, to, to restock and is really causing damage in, in Russia. And there was a lot of skepticism at the beginning on how effective this was, but um, you know the sanctions regime, um, we always said it's not going to work immediately, but we're seeing now um, that the, the, the toll being extracted is very severe. Um, also on, um, on um, energy, the fact that um, we were able to rid ourselves of first of Russian coal, then of Russian oil, now of Russian gas. I think, yes, Gazprom will make a lot of money looking back in 22, but the sources of revenue in 23 are getting less and less. The fact that we now have a hard cap on Russian oil, the fact that we are not importing any molecules in Germany, very few molecules in the rest of Europe, that will very strongly impact adversely the, the ability of Russia to finance this, this war operation. So in that sense, uh, I think in terms of how did we respond, I think it's, it, it was quite forceful. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest moments I had in, in, the, in the last year was in May when I accompanied Chancellor Olaf Scholz um, and Presidents Macron and Draghi and Johannes together with uh, President Zelensky announced the candidacy status of 
Ukraine, well, the, the support of those of the four countries for the candidate mm -hmm. status. And as you know, there was a lot of controversy at the time about this question within the European Union and the fact that in Kiev, they announced it basically solved the questions three days later, the European yeah. Union made the decision unanimously. So in that sense, that was also, I think, um, a very important impetus because it goes exactly in the direction of what Odil was saying, what is important for private sector investment. The fact that the European Union has now said we will give candidacy status assures every investor that in the next five years, whatever amount it takes, um, of time it takes, all of the rule of law questions, all the questions of concern to private sector investors are being incentivized in a massive way by the, the, the sort of alignment that there will be on, on coming to the, to the acquis um, of the European Union. So I think that is both important for Ukraine per se as striving to the European Union, but also for investors and incentivizing this investment um, because it gives you a very clear path into um, a, the, all of the legal requirements, but also a lot of the funding that will become available as the proximity to, between Ukraine and the European Union um, gets closer and closer. Thank you so much. I'd like to go back uh, to the Deputy Prime Minister because uh, a number of you mentioned the private sector. Uh, so what are your plans in terms of um, reforms of the private sector as part of the broader reconstruction effort? Could you tell us a little more about what you're planning there? Um, for private sector, yes. So for private sector, I mentioned before, uh, we are working out uh, um, insurance mechanism that will allow them to invest in Ukraine during the war time. So it's actually, it's, it's, it's a new mechanism. Previously, something common, it was previously uh, um, uh, during the war, like maybe 30, 30 years or 40 years ago. So now we, we, we asked uh, Expert Credit Agency and uh, MIGA and DFC just to, to, to review their portfolio of the products and proposed uh, the product, products will, that will, be, uh, will satisfy uh, this company willing to invest to, in Ukraine right now during the war time. Uh, absolutely think it was a deal, so we need to invest now, not to wait until the war will be finished. So for, for other things that we keep uh, providing corporate, corporate government reform, and now uh, we have in, uh, this uh, supervisor board of Naftagas, we, we think that we will set up a new supervisor board of Naftagas mm -hmm. that will be, uh, the, the interviewing will be finished and the, the whole procedure will be finished by the end of this uh, week. And the next week, there is going to be new supervisor. But it's it's uh, important because Tanta Gas is a vital uh, company for energy system. So it's uh, and we will keep keep going to provide and launch corporate governments. Uh, so also another plan is it's deregulation uh, for, for Ukrainian business and uh, foreign business. And uh, for for uh, th there are some um, there was some ideas and uh, discussion about uh, the, the tax uh, reform, but. Uh, I think that for now, what we need is just uh, to keep the macroeconomic stability. But now, because uh, if you look at the, our expenditure, 50% of our expenditure is caused by our um, partners. And 50% of our expenditure is, is, uh, is covered by Ukrainian business, by the revenue and uh, taxes that we collect inside of country. So that's why we need to uh, keep Ukrainian company operating and uh, that's why we, we will together with our AFIs provide these different programs. Uh, first of all, it's access to finance and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a insurance. This is the main thing that uh, should be on the table right now during the war time to persuade Ukrainian business continue working and to persuade foreign companies uh, come to Ukraine during the war time and start business. As you know, our president said that Ukraine um, exactly on the second day of the victory will become the mecca for investments. So that's why we, we, you know, and he always stressed that for this company willing to come and to work exactly on the next day, they should start it right now to make the preliminary studies, to make uh, some additional analysis not to wait time and to gain um, the, the biggest uh, opportunity on the next uh, day after the victory. Mara, 
Madam Deputy Prime Minister, one more thing. We haven't talked too much about uh, the social aspect or the mm -hmm. societal aspect of the, of the uh, needs that the Ukrainians have. Of course, it's tragic for, for children. Uh, there is always the, the, the risk of really losing uh, the traction you need to have with children on education, uh, health care, etc. So could you just give us a, a sense of the needs and also what kind of um, considerations you have around that societal tissue of Ukraine also for the reconstruction? I'm, maybe it's already part of some of those discussions that you're having with partners. So for uh, social needs, um I would say, so I think that the big challenge for us is going to be unemployment rate. Unemployment rate related to the fact that uh, 7, 7 million Ukrainians are living abroad right now, and it's a uh, majority of them, 90%, it's, a, it's a, our labor that uh, will very, very actively engaged in the in Ukrainian economy, so we need to return them back. And um, uh, unemployment rate inside of country, so if you look at the numbers, so but National Bank of Ukraine uh, estimates 30 um, 30 percent of, uh, of unemployment rate, but uh, it means that 4.6 million Ukrainians can are uh, searching for a job and not able to find it. But uh, these numbers consist of 2.6 million out of country and uh, that are willing to come right now and to work, and 2 million inside of country. So that's why what we're trying to do right now. It's we understand that we're rely a lot on our partners and we should show that we're also uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, limit our costs and we uh, you know, um, decrease the um, expenditure for the unemployment fees. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're trying, we're trying to stimulate people to work and we are create it called Army of Recovery. So for those Ukrainians willing to work and participate in the recovery on this early stage, or to help uh, regional state administration to participate in, in the preparation of the heat and season, they can join this army of recovery. It's also a governmental program. Uh, that uh, the, the main idea is just to, to uh, provide them with a proper uh, job places for Ukrainians willing to work. So the main idea right now is for those one that are unable to find a job to provide it with an army of recovery, for those who have entrepreneurship skills to provide some guarantees, financial and granting from the government to set up or enlarge their business. And it is an extremely popular program right now in Ukraine. It's, uh, we have for, 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 for just for several months, 16,000 applications from Ukrainians that uh, previously had a uh, working experience in business, just willing right now to set up or enlarge their activity during the war time. So we are like a government, uh, just need, need to provide people with opportunity to work and to develop their skills during the, the war time. Because residential uh, restore, restoring of the residential building, and we're very grateful for the partners that provide us uh, with different const construction and uh, workplace in that factors that influence Ukrainians to return back or to stay in Ukraine and to fight uh, by the end. Thank you. So just a quick reaction because we're coming to an end, but just uh, from Alexei, you, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister mentioned, of course, unemployment. So obviously there is war, people are fleeing, uh, there's a lot of disruption. I have talked to some executives in Ukraine and I know how much uh, big companies are also part of the picture. So I'm just interested, for example, your employees. How are you dealing with the fact that maybe some of them are displaced? How do you, how do you take care of them? First of all, I'm very proud of uh, our employees. I think the role of Ukrainian right now is uh, the direct service to your country. You can do it either on the battlefield or in the service. You, can, you, could, you should serve to your people. That is why we have some part of our employees on the front line and the rest in the office. Of course, we have some part that have left the country. We all understand it. There are different circumstances. Uh, many of them have come back already, and I'm really proud of it. Uh, I know many of our personnel is actively working under the shelling and uh, uh, constant risk to their life, and they're doing it uh, absolutely voluntarily with open heart and mind. And uh, I'm sure that uh, the strategy of breaking the spirit 
of Ukrainians will never work and Ukrainians will go ahead. That is a very important and historical moment for us. The next enemy Ukraine should fight is internal enemy, which is definitely lies in the area of anti-corruption, corporate governance, reforms agenda, judicial reform, all the factors that are desperately needed to this country regardless of the war. Let us remember, did Ukraine suffer from equity shortage before the war? Yes. We still were looking for international investment, for IFIs to come and others. And it didn't work in the way we wanted. We should perform uh, reforms agenda as soon as possible, and we cannot wait until the war is over. We should do it right now. Because once, once the war is over, no one is willing to invest in the country which is not reformed. And we're doing it right now. I used to be the member of Ukrainian government for the last three years, and I can tell you that Ukra Ukrainian government worked 24-7 during the war. No governor, no mayor of Ukraine left, uh, left the country, left the job. Mm. It's very important. And we can perform during the war. We can do reforms during the war. And maybe it is the best moment to do, because during the war, the situation is black and white. You should win and you should survive. Hmm. That means you should do reforms. Right now you do it immediately. So once you prevail, the country is more capable and more interface oriented for the international investment. Thank you so much. We have two minutes left. So quick reactions uh, going back to you, Minister Skinari. Uh, so I happen to come from a country that uh, uh, then became part of the EU, and I still remember the tremendous momentum that the accession process created, which unprecedented uh, momentum in, in the history of my country. So I just wonder um, how you look from Helsinki, now uh, Ukraine is an EU Canada country, to the future of the relationship between the EU and Ukraine. What would be your hopes or how do you view it from Helsinki overall? on that relationship? Finland, Sweden, Austria, becoming members 1995. Yeah. I still remember yeah. that well. A yeah. lot of ambitiousness, a lot of uh, implementation. But as I said here earlier, rule of law, reforms, of course, there is a roadmap. There is a roadmap and everything is doable. And for instance, Finland has supported Ukraine with the expertise and know-how of rule of law. So all these elements are doable. And of course, we really hope that we can see these reforms in action. But the most important thing is the spirit, commitment of the country, its people and the decision makers. So of course, uh, European Ukraine is, is, is a goal that we all would like to see. Thank you. Maybe the same question to you, Mr. Cookies. Well, I mean, I think Ukraine has huge potential. I mean, the um, the amount of skill and talent and natural resources available in Ukraine should make every investor interested in the country. I mean, we're seeing that in the temporarily displaced people. There is no country of origin of people coming to Germany who are as keen to learn the language, to work, with skills as developed, even though they know they only want to stay in Germany, the vast majority, for a few months, a year or two. They still, if you talk to German industry federations, they're very keen um, to employing citizens from the Ukraine as soon as it's possible. And usually it's, it works very well. And all of the companies from Germany investing in the Ukraine already are saying, um, as soon as the rule of law issues are resolved, the quality of the the skills um, in the Ukrainian population is enormous. The labor participation rates is enormous. The amount of space and natural resources and energy in terms of renewable power <clears throat> of the Ukraine is immense. So in that, in that sense, uh, I can only agree. And of course, the, the integration into the EU will bring a lot of um, structural funds and and support mechanisms that will, that will speed that up um, as the process towards 
um, <clears throat> towards EU extension um, um, happens. So in that sense, I think um, all, all stars are aligned in that sense. Um, and then don't forget, we have now, as of um, December last year, the, <clears throat> the international multi-agency donors platform set up. So the we now have a forum for all of the international and global support mechanisms. Um, and we were very conscious when we set this up at the Berlin conference together with the European Union and the G7 um, to crowd in private investors. So all of you from the private sector, um, um, please look at this uh, platform very carefully because we want to crowd in private capital alongside all of the um, mm. government money um, to set up incentives for the reform um, um, process and of course also the investment process. Thank you. And just uh, finishing our discussion today uh, with Madame Renaud Basso, EBRD has played such a major role in, in transforming uh, again Eastern Europe and other economies. I followed your work very closely and when uh, economies then graduate from your programs, it's also a signal or a sign of, uh, of, of a, you know, they're in a good place, they're ready. And so if, if you look to the future, as, uh, if you were to look to the graduation there, uh, what makes you, just in very briefly, what makes you hopeful when you look at the, uh, the, the landscape of Ukraine and outside military risks, of course, also, what would be the things that you would maybe point to in terms of risks as advice so that uh, then uh, really you see and yet another big successful program being wrapped up in Ukraine in the future. Over to you. Now first, I fully share the idea that the fact that the war has really sort of transformed in a way the government and the, 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 eff the efficiency of the institution. Huh? So in the, in the current under huge pressure and the need really to deliver, things are functioning much better than they used to be. And I mean, I mean and some issues have really been addressed. So I think that's a very positive place to be. And I agree that the European perspective and European accession process will be a dr key driver in terms of further reform, rule of law, governance, and so forth. And um, this should really be, this will really be the basis for transforming, deep transformation of the country. I think that the, the reconstruction will be a huge opportunity for investors because I mean, and, and there has been some. Uh, I attended some of some meeting with uh, foreign investors um, in uh, different countries where you see the appetite to. I mean, reconstruction means a lot of activity and, and so forth. So that, but what is important also is investment in the country and not only to rebuild but also to develop activity there. And and there there is a huge potential. We will need to think about specific instrument, and I think everything you mentioned about you know insurance and so forth because probably still in the reconstruction phase there may be some remaining uncertainties or risk that needs to be covered uh, but but I'm pretty sure that um, this could really be a big driver in, in growth rebound and, and more prosperity for Ukraine thank you with that advice we are uh, concluding uh, our session today in a way what we've just did here, we were talking about the immediate needs, but also at the same time investing in the future. That's frankly the philosophy of the annual meeting this year, the dual vision of navigating 2023, but also simultaneously investing for the long term. So thank you so much and particular thanks uh, to uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and the CEO of Naftogaz for joining us here. I know it was uh, not an easy journey. You left a country at war, so thank you so much for coming. All the best.